Hello, thank you for joining us for a very important talk this evening. We would like to talk about testing, which is obviously the most important thing to everybody in the room. I am Chet Haas. And I am Romain Guy. And we're going to tell you a little bit more about ourselves. It's always important to set the context for the speakers. I am working for the company that we call Testing Efficiency for Superior Testing, or TEST. I am a principal, founder, CEO, CTO, COO, many other things. I also cook. <laughs> I have a total of 25 years in testing. Five of those years were spent writing tests. Seven of those years writing test frameworks for testing, test writing, and 29 years giving presentations about testing. I have a certificate of testing, test, 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 testing. Otherwise known as t -t -t test. T -t -t. So more importantly, I am Romain. I work for the company that we've created, Testing Efficiency for Super Testing, or TEST. I am the other principal, the other founder. I am not the CEO, not the CTO, not the CEO, but I am tester in chief. I'm also a test ninja, a test master, a test rock star, a test guru, and a test wizard. And I do have a black belt in test. I'm also the well-known author of Breaking Bad, a whole history of tasteful testing. Testing. I have 17 years of experience. I was uh, Chet's understudy for many years, so seven years as an adjoint uh, test test writer, nine years as a test test leading uh, in test, and I am not test testing certified. I failed the test. <laughs> I believe most of us are familiar with test-driven development, or known as Tadid. Uh, we don't want to talk about that today. We believe that there's a lot more to testing than simply writing tests. Um, we believe that it's more important to talk about test-driven test development, but how can you verify that the results of that said testing are uh, valid? Uh, of course, you need testing of that, and how do you know that that's actually working? You need testing of that as well. Um, this is, of course, known as Tadid, Tadid, Tadid. Now, this process works in conjunction with something that we call test availability development assurance, or ta-da! <laughs> and we like to motivate our discussion today with a little bit of data um, to convince you if you are not already convinced about how important everything that we're talking about is. Um, so here's some to data. Um, we believe firmly that the more tests you have, the more quality you have in the product. Um, this is clearly represented by the following graph. On the right, you see that the claims are justified. Now, sometimes people have concerns that if you write more tests, that is more code, that means longer build times for the product. We have a graph which represents this. Uh, on the x-axis, you go from zero to many tests, um, and then we see the build times on the y-axis over there. Uh, and in fact, it is true. The more tests that you have, the more code that needs to be compiled, the longer the build times are, but the way that we think about it is in terms of the peak testing zone, or pdzz. And that's where you want to be. As many tests as possible, as long a build time as you can make it, because that means that you have just enough tests to test your product. Finally, we'd like to, like to talk about Tadata's virtual testing loop, or TADAVITAL. Now, it's a fact that as you write code as software engineers, you create bugs. That is part of software. And as you create those bugs, you realize you need tests um, to make sure that you catch those bugs. As you write tests, of course, you are creating code. And we think of this as that virtual testing loop, which has many ramifications. Uh, other consequences of writing those tests, most important of which for software engineers, is job security. Finally, we'd like to, you to take a look at a couple of applications. Now, one of these applications was written with no tests whatsoever, and the other was written with many, many tests. Now, if you take a look at the one on the left and the one on the right, how many people think that the one on the left has more tests? Okay. And how many people think that the one on the right has more tests? Okay. This is a sharp crowd. Chet, of course, what do you think is the one with more tests? I don't think. I know. I wrote the slide. <laughs> so, obviously, the one on the right has more tests, therefore it's of higher quality. We can see that here. 
Uh, I'm sorry, no, I was wrong. It's actually the one on the left. <laughs> the one on the left has more tests. Now, the fact that we couldn't actually quite tell the fact that they looked very similar is irrelevant. Just the fact that it has more tests means that it is better. All right. So I think we've sufficiently motivated the topic. Now we'd like to talk about a framework that we have developed um, that we call Toward a Better Testing Framework, or TIBDIF. So here's our use case. Uh, we want to test a very simple method. We have a public method that returns an integer. It's called getBar. And in a typical test, you test what value is returned. Uh, some other things are missing from that test. When is the value returned? Why are re you returning that value? And more importantly, how? But also, we need to take a look at what language is assumed, what threading model are you using, what are the performance constraints, what is the time period, what is the time of the day, what is the weather, what is the temperature like, on what network are you running, what is the computer architecture, and so on and so forth. So we're introducing the Tech for Nothing, grant, uh, tech nothing for Granted Testing Framework, or TNFGTF. So here's an example to work through. Um, we believe it's not uh, possible or not wise to actually trust the network um, in the testing that you're doing. Um, so we want to handwrite the test. So instead of entering the code on the computer that talks over the network to the integration server, we handwrite the test, obviously, um, and then we mail it through the postal system. And then on the other side, uh, we have an OCR system to scan and convert the test into source code. And then finally, we compile, and we run, and we validate. And who here can see the flaw in what we're doing? So what else do we need to do? Anybody? There is at least one. They don't know. OK, so this is why you need to be in this room listening to this presentation right now, clearly. I hope you're learning as much from this as you lack in knowledge coming into the room. So obviously here we are depending upon the OCR system to work, right? So we're going to need to test that system, right? Okay, it was a trick question. We also need to verify that everything else here also needs to be tested. Take nothing for granted. So our solution to TNFGTF is the anal retentive testing, or the art form. So here's how it starts. You want to test a method, but we need to verify the test. So we need to first to verify the testing method methodology of the test. To do this, we're going to verify the compiler, the hardware, the language. We also need to validate the transport layer. We already covered that. And of course, the next step is to verify the correctness of the fabric of space and time. So to do this, we need to first move the test uh, in a parallel universe to remove all possible interference. But we also need to, to move the testers to yet another parallel universe. Obviously, we're still working on those last few points. It's a little difficult. So we are, here's our status. We sent an email to Stephen Hawking. We asked for his help. We have not received a reply yet. <laughs> another problem we have, we've identified is the problem of human resources. Uh, so you have testers to write the test to test the test. But who tests the, the testers who write the test to test the test? So we have this new process that we'd like to implement. Every morning, each tester needs to undergo a full medical exam to prove that their worthiness as testers. So the tester becomes a testee, and we like to use pair programming uh, because with pairs of testees, we can solve hairy problems. So now that we've covered some of the frameworks that we are currently developing, we'd like to talk about existing and emerging patterns for test development in the wider world. So as you get more into testing, it's nice for you to know what the options are that you should be investigating. Uh, this is, of course, the Emerging Software Development Testing Patterns, or STDIPA. So first of all, there is the concept of a test suite. I think everybody is familiar with this. A collection of multiple tiers of rigorous testing to ensure top quality release metrics, including such things as unit tests, integration tests, user tests, validation, verification tests, coffee breaks, mutation tests, smoke tests, customer acceptance tests, uh, and release tests. Now, compared with that, we have an emerging technology, which is known as the test one-bedroom apartment. It's pretty much exactly like a test suite, except there's more room. Uh, we have the concept of regression tests, uh, where you just simply made, need to make sure that nothing breaks. Uh, we compare that with the emerging test pattern coming out called aggression tests, uh, which when there is a test failure, it results in broken legs.
also when there's a test success. Unfortunately, we found that aggression testing was not enough, uh, so we took inspiration from the generative testing methodology it's used in functional programming. Instead of writing your test, uh, the tests are derived from templates. So we introduced degenerative uh, testing. Failing tests, uh, when the tests are failing, we eliminate the problem by first removing the test, then we remove the code, the module the code belongs to, obviously the employee, <laughs> the department, uh, the executive in charge of the department, the company, the government, the continent, and we call this the nuclear test. <laughs> to prove the effectiveness of this methodology, uh, we have data. So here's a graph of before and after. So before, we had a lot of test failures, as you can see here, and after uh, just one. Uh, we don't like to talk about this one. There's the existing concept of smoke test where um, there is simply a subset of tests to meet minimum requirements for whatever the product is. Uh, we compare that with the emerging pattern of vape test, um, which is a smoke test used to test vaporware. Mocking is a very powerful testing tool. Uh, it's when you replace the implementation for stable and predictable testing. We found that ridiculous test, ridiculing testing was much more efficient. We just make fun of the failing code until the problem goes away. Fuzz testing is used uh, to have random inputs and you're just making sure that nothing weird going on should actually cause the system to crash. We compare that with furry testing where random inputs are cute. Uh, it's important to notice that uh, furry testing is not the same as fury testing, uh, which consists of banging loudly until on the keyboard until the problem goes away. So continuous integration, most of you probably use it. You just run tests on every build. And we like to use continuous disintegration. Uh, every time a test fails during one of those builds, we delete the source code. Because we, well, we, we all know that less code equals fewer bug, or else the Functional tests are there simply to make sure that things work. We compare that with strike testings, which is to ensure that nothing was, works. It's a methodology that's very popular in France with the uh, train company. <laughs> so now that we've covered all of our frameworks and all of our solutions, you are ob obviously convinced uh, that we have the right solution. So here's our call to action. We'd like you to remember the seven pillars of test testing success, or SPITS. The first one is TDD. We covered TDD, TDD, TDD. Ta-da! ta da BAMT, obviously, uh, TBTF, and uh, uh, the seventh pillar, the TINGVTF, that's one is hard to say. Um, but we also have uh, ART and ISDIPTP. If we pull this all together and summarize it in a way that I think everyone can take away with you from the conference, um, it really comes down to I think you missed the T. And thank you for attending. Testing, testing, a testament. Or Tifatet. Do you really want more? Yeah. That makes no sense. <laughs> One, two. Uh, more importantly, it needs a lot of money in our pockets. <laughs> Isn't it getting romantic in here? I was waiting for this chat. <laughs> I think we missed our cue. 
Ta-da! It turns out, by amazing coincidence, we had a second presentation ready because not only do we care deeply, deeply, deeply about testing, but we also care deeply about giving more presentations. <laughs> we have been thinking not only about tests, but also about language features. Having new languages is very important in software because it gives engineers something else to build their clients for. So hi, I'm Roman Guy. I'm Chet Haas, still. And we part, we're part of Prose. And cons. L. 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 C. L -C. <laughs> oh, we were playing the last slide. <laughs> we didn't test this. So pros and cons, L. C. Because we are professionals. And consultants. And an LLC. And today we'd like to talk about functional and reactive Turing complete language. Or FART. There are many elements about this language. We'll go through of them, a few of them today. And if you'd like to learn more, we'd be happy to bill you for more information. First of all, I'd like to talk about CISC. This is obviously complex instruction set keywords. It comes from the concept in the 80s. There was a, a difference in opinion about CPU. Should they have high-level complex instructions or should they have very low-level fine-grained instructions that required more code, a little bit more tedious? We believe languages should have more complex concepts. Um, so, for example, all of us need to write Hello World apps all the time, especially when there's a new language to learn. So we write the code, we run the tests, uh, we run F-A-R-T my class, and it outputs Hello World. So it must be working. Wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to write that much code to do that, though? Uh, what if there was a language concept that simply did Hello World instead of having to actually go through the tedium of outputting it? But we could take it further. What if there was a class that actually extended it? What if there was API for Hello World? In fact, what if it was just a command in the shell itself? So F-A-R-T. Don't even need to call that. You just say hello world and we're done. Uh, we use this concept in, uh, in many different ways. So there's uh, really important programs that you could write with this concept. You could just say Towers of Hanoi with some arbitrary number and you're done. You didn't need to write the code. Right? Um, also, this comes in handy in interviews uh, all the times. You can do things like actually solve a hash table problem. Instead of writing white code on the board, you could simply run this and it would be done. You could do a bubble sort. Uh, you could do an alphabetical string sort, which actually handily returns big O notation. This is very good in phone interviews because you can simply run this and then run the following, on, uh, following command uh, afterwards to simply optimize it. We've identified a very common issue in uh, programming, and that's spelling mistakes. So this is an example that I've actually seen in our code base. We had a method called unflatten. Unflatten is spelled with two Ts, not one, two. So this is how you would call it, unflatten with two Ts, not one, two. But this is how we called it, unflatten with one T. In Java or Kotlin, this is an error. In uh, FART, this is valid. Multiple spelling mistakes can be uh, are allowed by the language. This can sometimes um, be a little ambiguous, uh, but the language is smart enough to figure out which method you want it to invoke. This is also useful for, lo for localization. So here we have someone who's obviously from the US, who wrote this data class called color. Uh, and this is how you use it. Unfortunately, uh, any of your employees working from England would not be very happy about it because the spelling is wrong, so you can use the uh, country namespace as shown here to use the proper spelling instead. Uh, we believe that Unix developers uh, will be very happy with the following language feature, um, or you could rewrite this as... There are simply too many vowels to type in words. It's simply too easy to read them. Wouldn't it be nice if we could type them faster and more cryptically? Um, so, for example, uh, we have the log method, uh, but we could abbreviate that as LG. Uh, we have uh, resize, quad, linearly. That sure is a lot of awkward letters to type. Um, we believe it's more readable in something like this. Um, now, Y is sometimes a vowel and sometimes it's not. Um, so you have the option. You can spell it either way. Uh, and finally, here's an example. If you have a method called graphit, um, then that abbreviates to the following. Now, you may notice that uh, 
there could be a method called graphite in the same sort of space that would also abbreviate to the same, uh, uh, the same abbreviation. And you may be wondering how is the compiler or the runtime going to handle this situation. It simply uses heuristics internally to figure out what it thinks you wanted to do and then arbitrarily picks one of those results. Uh, we have uh, the concept in natural languages that we use styles, right? We can change characters, we can change fonts to give emphasis and uh, semantic meaning to words. We like that in the language as well. Wouldn't it be nice if we could take advantage of that? That do really important task looks very important. Would it be nice if we could bold it and then we would actually call that first instead of all the intervening stuff <laughs> ahead of it? Writing efficient code is pretty difficult. Uh, it takes a lot of work to optimize code, so it wouldn't be easier if you could write code that looks fast. So you can, you can do this by uh, putting your code in italics. It will automatically make your code go fast. And finally, we have the concept of underlining. Uh, this is, of course, uh, going to execute a go-to when as soon as it gets there, it's just a reference to some other place in the code. That's simply a link. One of the most important features of our language is the tautological interpretation of numerical digital representation, or Tinder for short. <laughs> so one of the problems we've seen in code is that sometimes the ones look like lowercase l's. Uh, so here's an example of a number, 1336. You can also write it this way, because you know it looks the same. Unfortunately, that can lead to a lot of confusion and ambiguity. Um, so we found it's uh, much better to go back to Roman numerals. So here's an example. 65,536, don't write it this way. We found that it's much better to use this notation instead. Uh, you have to be careful because if you have a variable called x and you assign a value to it, like in this example, uh, you are redefining the value 10 to be equal to 6. I should point out too that uh, the fact that we use uh, i to also mean numbers means you should probably avoid using it for iteration variables because it can get confusing. We have the concept of dependency rejection. People like using dependency injection as a way of simplifying construction of objects. Uh, we also believe that dependency rejection can simplify your code quite a bit. Uh, if you annotate code with reject, um, then it can result in simplifying situations where you try to do something and the runtime just says no. So Booleans are very important in every programming language, but we found that the world is much more complicated. Not everything is black and white. There's a spectrum of truth. We call that truthiness. So we decided to combine Booleans and floats, and we call this new type the bloat. <laughs> and here's how it works. Um, so bloat is pretty much a statistical uh, representation. So let's say we have a color. We say, eh, it's about 20% red. But it's also about 30% green. And you, you can convert back to Boolean using the equal, equal, ish operator and in this case, it will be true. We believe it's important to have obfuscation for the code. You want to protect your intellectual property right. You don't really want random users and developers seeing what's going on in the code. Obfuscation is important. We make that even easier because we obfuscate the code every time you save it. Now, not only <laughs> does this make your code very secure, but it also makes your job very secure because no one will be able to tell what's going on with the code. So let's take a look at an example here. We have sort of you know, standard code, a lot of things going on there, but we can simplify this. We can eliminate the variables and make them obfuscated. Uh, we can also eliminate the methods, condensing everything, compacting everything is getting tighter and tighter. We have object types, we can obfuscate those. Primitive types, why all those letters all over the place? And numbers, in fact, why don't we eliminate those? Also keywords. Um, and then finally, when we get down to the end, we keep going and going. There's lots of optimizations we put into this. Um, then the final code for that method then looks like this. <laughs> so we have the concept of temporals. Uh, many languages and platforms have this. Uh, they have the concept of futures. Uh, there's also, we have the concept of past, and we also have the concept of present. So future is, uh, this code will run eventually. Um, past is a guarantee that that code will have already run. Now, if you reach the code and it has not run al already, then it will kill the process, restart it, call that code, and then get to the same point in the code to guarantee that past contract um, that it has with you, the developer. Uh, and then, obviously, present is the concept that uh, this code will run on all major holidays. Now it's time to talk about our business model because we like money. 
so we took a page from the video game industry. Uh, they have this concept called freemium, as opposed to premium, where you have to pay with real money for items in your game. So we're introducing the first freemium programming language. Uh, to unlock all the features, you have to buy loot boxes for the low, low price of $1.99, and you will randomly get one rare feature, <laughs> three uncommon features, and six common features. So here's an example of uh, some of the features you will get. Uh, so rare features, you know, we, 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 we want your money, uh, but we want you to be happy. So the rare features are features you don't actually really need most of the time. So in the rare category, we have the doubles, the longs, the vargs, or reflection. Because uh, if you use reflection, you're doing something pretty naughty already. Uh, part of the uncommon features, inner classes, static functions, annotations, and strings. And finally, common features, variables, methods, loops, you know, simple things like that. So you might want to buy a few loot boxes to make sure you have branches and loops to start with. Um, we also have the gold tier uh, loot boxes. Uh, they're a little more expensive. They go for $19.99. They contain one gold tier feature and three rare features. And amongst the gold tier features, we, do th we have things like removing the slips that are introduced by the compiler in your code. <laughs> for $20, it can make you look very good uh, with your boss. We remove the memory leaks in the garbage collector. The math operations always produce the same results. We give you a debugger and the print function. You might want to buy a few of those boxes. Annotations are very important in modern languages. Um, so we have concepts of annotations, but we've taken those concepts and changed them slightly to some, be something more popular. Uh, more usable. Um, so there is the concept of override, where you are declaring that a method overrides uh, a similar method in a superclass. We have an annotation called overridden, which is more a communication from the developer to the developer using this API that the developer completely disagreed this method should be written, but the manager demanded it. Uh, in other platforms, there's a concept of nullable and not null. Um, similarly, we, we have something called unknown and not nullable not knowable. Unknown is uh, code that the developer simply wasn't sure what was going on. And not knowable, uh, the developer is posing it as a problem to you to try to figure out what's going on. <laughs> Finally, there's the concept in other platforms and languages of deprecated. This method has gone away. We do not believe, as the company shipping this product, that it should be called anymore. We have a similar concept in our language, um, but it is when the case is so bad this code is crap. You should put the defecated annotation. We spend a lot of time writing code, and it would be nice if we could express ourselves a little more when we write code. So here is a very simple example taken from the Java programming language TM. We're just assigning a value to a Boolean. And there are languages out there who are already trying to do this a little bit. For instance, in Swift, you could name the variable with an emoji. Uh, and we try to go a little further. Uh, the literals can be replaced with emojis as well. The operators can become emojis, and obviously the types. Uh, we find that much more pleasant, enjoyable, and easier to read. Here's another real-world example from our own code base. Uh, so this is a big decimal called stock price with an at inject on top of it. We also believe that, um, that the emoji feature in particular is going to attract a lot of millennials to our platform. Uh, obviously, you'll have to buy one of the loot boxes to benefit from it. Uh, we did a lot of research to figure out why there are so many bugs in applications, and we realized that, uh, so we use imperative programming, and this is pretty rude to computers, and the computers don't really like to be told what to do. So we, less, we like to introduce the politeness or object-oriented programming, or POOP. <laughs> so when you invoke a method, this is how you do it normally. That's the rude way, so stop doing that. Uh, now you have to say please. <laughs> if you do not say please, the method will not run. If the method returns a value, you have to say please and thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, you will get an undefined result. So some of the language features that we have are all about the productivity of the developer. We did some surveys and compiled some charts and data. Um, so we'll prove some of this information to you right now. Um, it's a fact that if there is more code being produced, then there for there is more productivity uh, by the developer. Now, if we look at this, um, the other way around, uh, we see that code, more code actually means more productivity and the other way around. Now, similarly, the more code you produce, the more lines of code you produce. 
subtle distinction, but the more lines of code you produce, therefore, the more productive you are. And uh, if I highlight these, I think you'll see that there's more emphasis on them. And then finally, um, we can take a look at productivity in terms of maximizing the number of lines of code. Um, so if we take this simple example, I'm blinking this for emphasis. We take the simple example, we have three lines of code here, not a lot. Um, if you're filling out your performance packet at the end of the year, it's gonna look like maybe you didn't do that much. Wouldn't it be nice if the language and the tools could help you produce 31 lines of code instead? Many languages, including Kotlin, have the concept of coroutines. They are computations get, that can be suspended without blocking a thread. They are extremely useful to implement asynchronous programming. Uh, we like to introduce union routines. Uh, they're denoted by the strike keyword. There are methods that there are, there are functions that will always block the current thread. Uh, if the function is big enough, if the union routine is big enough, it will block all the threads. Uh, instead of using the strike keyword, you can use the international symbol uh, for strike, the French flag. <laughs> and uh, we were recently contacted by the uh, train company in France. Uh, they implemented these features very successfully recently. We think that the go-to operator that is strangely absent in a lot of languages is very powerful, but we think that it was not as popular because it was so limited in its functionality. It just told you where to go to. So traditionally, you would have line 100, go to 250, it would go there. Wouldn't it be useful if at 250, you could guarantee that you came from 100 as well? Uh, and then you could do stuff. Um, uh, similarly, we also have the else go back. Uh, so a nice handy condition, sort of a match pair there. Um, specifically for Android developers, sure, it's nice to be able to go back, but sometimes it's difficult to go up. So we have kind of a back versus up fun function. And we really like go to, so we introduce line number inference. So here's a typical example of how you go to, you have a line number 10, you call run foo, you go to 10 and you have a nice loop. Then you add another line of code, run bar, you can still go to 10, you can go to 11. Problems arise when you have more code between those two numbers. How do you do, how do you jump to this run fast, for instance, in the middle? You cannot. There are not enough integers between 10 and 11. So we're, introduced, we're introducing floating points for line numbers. Um, when the value does not exactly match a line number, we just round to the nearest line. You can also use the floating point go-tos to jump in the middle of the line. It's great for better code re reusability. Uh, so here, for instance, we execute run foo, we assign it to a variable, we run bar. We'd like to run foo again, but we don't want to assign the result a second time. So we, we go to 10.5 and we'll jump right in the middle of the line after the assignment. We should point out, too, if you have a concept of something else you'd like to do in this code, but you don't quite know how it's going to work yet, you should use an imaginary number instead. So we are creating a very formal language. Uh, we have formal proofs for the language and we have formal concepts in the language as well. Um, there are these concepts in other languages of you know, these loop constructs, these keywords like this. And we have similar concepts in our language except if is called mayhap, while is called whilst, do is called prithee, then is called henceforth, much more formal, all of these, I prefer them. For is hitherto, return is anon, and finally, break is for swear. But the most important part is that we use an appropriate font for these. Here's an example of code that you have to write as an Android developer all the time. You know you want to get the density, and you can't really remember where it is, because uh, you have to call get resource, get display metrics, and all that, uh, all those function calls. So we introduced the ellipsis operator, where you can just say context dot 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 density, and the compiler will just figure it out. <laughs> we didn't... We didn't want to uh, stay there, so you can use the dot, 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 dot operator. It will look in the entire package of your, uh, where the code is. You can use dot, 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 dot. It will look in the entire project for something called density. And obviously, the dot, 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 it will start looking in other running apps in the system. Uh, we have the concept of doc-driven development. Um, this is uh, familiar to anybody that's read any software engineering book. Um, that espouse the totally reasonable theory that real software developers write all the documentation first and then the code is simply an imp implementation detail. I think we all agree on that. Um, but wouldn't it be nice 
uh, if we could do that as part of the language and just have the compiler do this work for us. So here we have a method that clearly specifies what's going to go on in this method. The compiler would simply generate the code for us. Um, you could also have a method that resolves uh, database interdependencies um, or a method that uh, resolves world peace. Um, we tried this one, uh, currently returns null. Let me do this one. Uh, so, Are you sure? <laughs> we have a concept of easier threading. Multi-threaded programming is really difficult. It's kind of hard to ha know exactly what's in race conditions is going to be the value of any particular vari variable. So for example here, we have this thing var. It's difficult to know, impossible to know what the value is at any of these points because these threads are running in parallel and being swapped out. Um, so we simply use the space on the screen to help understand this. We would write this code as follows, um, where you're using the space on the screen to denote which thread is doing what. It's obviously clear what the value of these things are going to be uh, over time. Um, now, I should point out uh, that this is really powerful when you get to uh, running on an RTL. If you're localized on an RTL platform instead, then it's actually going to run from right to left instead. Uh, we have concept of auto debugging. I think all of us would agree that the first thing that we're going to do to be debug a problem is simply start commenting out code and see when the bug goes away. Uh, well, why doesn't the runtime do that for you? So it'll just auto comment uh, code along the way until the problem goes away, um, until it's done commenting everything, and then it automatically just checks in the fix like this. Uh, PM-driven development is an important concept. I think we all have product managers that get very frustrated at working with our engineering teams because uh, they ask for something and then it can take weeks or months or years or sometimes that feature doesn't even get done, obviously because of the ineptitude of the engineers, not because the request was unreasonable. Um, so they should be able to say something like, this app should run faster and use less memory, or let's increase engagement through user interaction or increase monetization by 10x. Now with our language feature, they can simply say these things and all they need to do to implement them is add line numbers. And with that, we're done. Uh, do we have time for Q&A? Uh, I believe we do. Maybe about, uh, about five minutes. If there are any important questions in the crowd, we would be uh, happy to answer them and, uh, uh, for free. We only take serious questions. Seriously. Which three features are available? Which three features are available? Three. Oh, three features. Uh, which three features are available? We have not decided that yet. Uh, it's possible there won't be any. Um, you're really going to need to, we did a statistical model, you're going to need to buy about 15 loot boxes in order to actually do your first compile. We also believe that the slides are more than enough to convince you to start uh, giving us money for the language. Yes, up there. Uh, my first question is, uh, what uh, is the current version of the language? And my second question is, uh, I'm eager to see the new features in the next version. Uh, the second question was a compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question I forgot after the compliment. The current version is uh, I, uh, because it's one in Roman numerals. Thank you uh, for the compliment. Yes. Um, question. Yeah. When will this be considered a first-class language in Android Studio? And follow up, should I stop my Kotlin migration? Uh, when is it going to be in Android Studio? I'm pretty sure they're already working on that. They are very clever folks, and I think they can see the advantages of this. Um, I can't speak for them, but I will anyway. So, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, are you hiring? Uh, we are hiring. <laughs> Somebody. Uh, not exactly sure who, how many, how much we're going to pay them, what exactly they're going to do, um, and how we're going to find the money to do it. You know what? It depends on whether people pay us today for the language, and then we'll talk. And you have to right. pass a test. Uh, yeah. Uh, PDD, it's cool, but I'm going to keep my job. Are you a PM? No. Oh, good. I didn't hear a question mark uh, there. He's worried that he's going to lose his job if the PMs can just write the code. Oh, yeah. It's, it is kind of a subtle way to get rid of PMs in the organization. No, no, actually, it's going to get rid of all the engineers. We need to rethink that language feature right now. Yeah. 
All right. Um, this is a draft language spec. Um, do uh, main CI uh, platforms already handle your, your language or? Do the main? CI platforms. Uh, continuous integration, I yeah. suppose. Computational um, intensity, I think. We have formal proof. <laughs> We have formal proofs uh, that the language works. We do not have binaries. Okay. Binaries are so tedious. We're academics. We're really, I think you can tell from this presentation that we're really, really smart um, and that actual working products are sort of below us. Um, so I know that's their problem to solve. Um, as you may know, uh, if we can't reproduce a bug, um, we can't fix it, so there's no bug. So my question is, uh, is it possible to remove the debugger for the next version? If we remove the need for the debugger, we wouldn't sell as many gold tier boxes. Um, no, but you can use one of our testing frameworks that will delete the code that fails the test. Also, one of the advantages of the language in the compiler is that um, it will detect uh, the rate at which you are injecting bugs into the source space, and if it's not high enough, then it'll start injecting its own. Uh, at a scale of 1 to 10, can my cat learn it? I did not understand that. At the, on the scale of 1 to 10? Can my cat learn it? How heavy is your cat? <laughs> two, and half, two and a half kilos. Uh, so that would be about five and a half pounds. So five and a half. So Last come question. on, ask a hard question. Last question. Final question goes to somebody. So great logo. Um, I was thinking, is it possible to have a different skin for the logo if I pay with a loot? I was thinking of a fruit, maybe an apple. You should give us money, we'll do anything you want. <laughs> great. But it's got to be cash. Thank you. <laughs>